Hey there, uh, today I'm going to run through how to set up essentially a sync between your Bubble database and your Xeno database. And what we're going to use today is the Bubble Data API. We're going to create our own custom function within Xeno and also set up a database table to allow us to essentially import that data from the Bubbles Data API. So um, first thing to note that to use the Bubbles Data API, you're going to need to have a paid account. So if you don't have a paid account, I recommend getting that set up. And one of the first things to do is uh, to essentially get your API set up is you're going to need to copy across a few items into Xano. So um, firstly, uh, inside of your bubble setup, you can head to your settings section and then head to your API. And what it's going to allow you to get is your data API root URL, which you're going to need this and also make sure that the tables that you're wanting to access or, or data types, I believe you call them inside of Bubble, you're looking to access and bring across the Xeno and make sure these boxes are enabled. You're also going to need to uh, essentially, uh, once you've copied this item for later, you're also going to need to create an API key and you're going to want to copy this item um, as it's created. And for this particular item, we're going to create what we call an environment variable inside of Xeno. So how we're going to do this is once you've got, uh, make sure you've got your Xeno system set up and you can just have a blank instance. You don't need to have anything uh, to get this set up. Inside of settings, we're going to hit manage and you're going to essentially be able to um, add a new variable here, which you can see I've created bubble API key. And I'm going to paste in the value that I've, I've received um, from bubble into this field here, which then means I'm going to be able to access this system variable throughout the Xeno system. So once you've got the bubble API key saved, I'm then going to head across into the database section inside of Xeno. You'll see I've created a table here, which is essentially my customers table. My customers table is designed to essentially emulate what I've got here inside of Bubble. And I tried to um, use as many different field types as I could. Um, I, uh, yeah, field types, you call them here. And I tried to use as many different types as possible um, for this scenario. So I've got an email, I've got a file, I've got a, a geographic address. Uh, I've got an image, uh, I've got a, a list of deals, which is a relationship of, of deals. So I've um, tried to go through uh, also yes, no, and use all the different um, field types that you can expect to see and how we'd bring them across into Xeno. And you'll note with these different um, field types that most of these items are very similar, but you'll notice that there is some um, items that have a different name. So for example, a yes, no field is what we call a Boolean inside of Xeno. And Items such as a geographic address, the way that a geographic address is returned is it's actually a JSON object. And inside a geographic address, which we'll see in a moment, you'll note that um, I've actually created an object. So inside of Xeno, you can add a new column by pressing the button here. And I've selected an object, which is a flexible structure with sub elements as per the description. And inside of this field, I've created essentially a text field for an address. And then I've created a decimal field for lat and a decimal field for long. And I'll explain why that is in just a moment. But essentially I've copied the structure that I've received from the bubble data API, which we'll see what responses we receive from that API in just a moment. So important to note that you will need to get your database set up first before you try and import data in. Um, we won't programmatically create our database today, but that is for a later session. But essentially, once we've got this set up, I've just used a myriad of an email for the email section. I've used a text or a string field for the name. I've used a text field for a file, which I'll explain in a moment as well as we're receiving a URL via the API. So once you've got this set up and you'll need to, to clone it based on your current um, table inside of, of Bubble, once that's set up, we can head in and I've created a custom function. So under library, you'll see there's functions. The reason I've used functions is what's handy about a function is it can be reused um, as part of an API. It can also be reused as part of a task. So functions are, as it says here, reusable pieces of business logic, which if you're smart with how you set up your user application, you can create a whole range of functions that can be reused to save you a whole heap of time in development. So essentially what we're looking to do is um, a bubble import. So what I'm doing first is I want to, first work out what is it that I can receive via the Bubble API. And how I'm setting this up is, as you would have noticed before, we had uh, inside of the settings, we copied across this data API root URL. And if we head to the Bubble documentation, what it essentially asks us to do is to add on to the end of this URL, 
the type name, which is essentially the, the table name that you'll be doing. So in my example, I'm accessing my customer's table inside of Bubble. And to access that, what I've done is I've essentially done an external API request, which is this option here, which you can add to your function stack. And the very first item within the external API request, I've added a URL. Instead, I've done a sent S as where we'll find the, the data type or the, the table is what we call it in Xeno. And the reason I've used the percent %s as opposed to typing in customer is I've used the sprintf filter, which is essentially a filter we can apply, which is going to essentially add in a, a string or a text into or an item or dynamically add a variable into a text string. So now instead of having uh, percent %s, uh, when I run this, it's going to dynamically add customer onto the end of my URL. You can also hard code that in there. I was just doing this to show this off. The other component of the Bubble Data API is it does require authentication. So in order to authenticate an API endpoint, what it has asked us to do is essentially add authorization bearer token into the header of the API. The way we can do that is essentially the header is, if I copy this, the header is by default a, an array already. So an array is a list of items. And in order to add an item into the array, we need to push that object into the array. By doing this, we now have the option to add that text value into our header. I've done this, as you can see inside of the API request here. So I'm not going to re-add this, but I've used the same methodology where I've got percent %s in the exact location with a space where I want to insert the bubble API key, which you'll notice is the environment variable that we've created earlier. And because we created that environment variable in our settings, when I type bubble API key inside my function stack, you'll see under the environment variable section that this key is now accessible. So I can just simply paste that in. And I didn't save that because I already had it. And we've now essentially set up the API to authenticate. So if I delete this one, and I run this at the top here, I've got my run and debug. We're now seeing that we're receiving the request uh, or response from Bubble. Now, if you're like me, um, maybe you're not so good at reading code and you wanted to know, this is great. We've now received our response. We can see it's a success. We're starting to receive our results here, which is perfect. This is the app data that we're wanting to receive, all our different customers. Now, now that we've got this information, I want to start to work with this. I want to add these records into my database. So the first things first, I want to work out what I'm actually working with inside this response. And there's some really cool tools you can use um, to do this. So firstly, what I've done is I've stopped and debugged um, on the customer's API, which once we've got an external API request, the output variable is this customer's API, which we can actually define what we want this output variable to be. So I've stopped and debugged on this to give me the whole uh, response. Then what I'm going to do is I can actually create a variable here to work out how to find the right pathway into this JSON. And how I'm going to do this is I'm firstly going to reference the customer's API variable, which we can see here. And then I'm going to use this subpath filter function. I'm going to paste in the entire response I received from my stop and debug step. And I can click on define. When I click on define, it allows me to actually select the path inside of the response to, to make sure that I'm working with the correct information. And as you can see, there's quite a few different layers in here to actually get to the result, which is what we're after. And there's response and then there's results. So if I click onto this, you'll now see that I've got the dot notation formed for me for the results, which is now coming out as variable one. If I stop and debug, on this fair one, bar one. We'll now see that we're only receiving the list of the items as opposed to the entire request with the headers and all the information that we, we didn't want. So I can hide this one temporarily and get rid of this stop and debug. And I've already created this item here, which is just the, the results called customer, dot, uh, customer underscore result. And because you'll see here inside of this result, We've got an array as the very start of our um, result, which means this is a list. 
And the very first item within the list goes all the way down to, to here, essentially. And then we've got record two, record three, record four. You'll note that there actually is a different format between record one and record two, because if we check into my bubble database, not every record has complete information, which we'll need to take into consideration for our next part. But now, um, now that we've got a, a list of the results and we want to start working with this, we need to use um, a tool that allows us to work through lists. In this particular scenario, I'm going to use our for each loop, which if you go into data manipulation in loops, you've got a whole range of different loops available. Why I want to use the for each loop in this example is it iterates over a list of items which means it's going to run over every single record within the response that we're receiving, which for an import scenario, it's exactly what I want to do. So how we do that is inside the for each loop, I'm now accessing the variable I created, which is the customer result, which is just this list of results. And for each item, it's going to output inside this loop an item called customer, which is going to be just one record within this list. So I can now reference customer and then any of these items or paths within the response to essentially add straight to my database. So if we stop and debug on what this, uh, this output is, which is just customer, and I run this, you'll see that I've now just got the single response, which is perfect because I can then add that single response into my database. And you'd think, great, now that I understand how to use dot notation, I can simply use the same methodology, customer, dot name, email, etc as the pathways to add these items into my database. This, this works perfectly. The first thing I'd like to note is that I've, when we're using an add or edit record um, function, inside of this is essentially first the option that allows us to find the record by. And because we're either adding or editing a record, it's first checking to see if a record exists. And if it does exist, we're going to edit that record as opposed to creating a new one. So we need to give it a unique identifier to reference. And the only unique identifier we have having an external database is the unique identifier of that database. So what we're using is we're using the ID, which is underscore ID is the pathway, which is the bubble unique identifier. This gives us something to concretely be able to essentially um, know if it's a unique record or not. So now that we've defined this and we've then set the different um, items, I'm going to run this and uh, see what we, we should get. And you'll note that, like I mentioned earlier, when we're setting up our database, we have an object for the geographic address. That's because I've copied the exact structure that Bubble is asking for. So we have an object, then we have the address, which is a text item or a string within the object. Then we have two uh, decimals for lat and long within this object as well. So that's why we set up that object earlier in the database with the exact same format as what we've received here from uh, Bubble. So if we run this, essentially I've now added this record, it's ID 124, and all this information here has been added. So if I jump into my database, I hit to customers, there we go. We now have that first record added into our DB. Excellent news. If I run, head back now and I want to run through all the records. I'm going to let this run now. So I'm going to remove the stop and debug, which I, I stopped after the first record was added because I had this stop and debug inside the loop I created earlier. If I now run this, unable to locate variable customer.data. Date, sorry. What does this mean? So essentially we've used stop notation inside our add or add record step. And we can't find customer.date. Why is that? Now, whenever you start to hit errors inside of your function stack, you want to be using your debugger, as this shows you exactly what's happened in the function. And we can see that we've got to our for each loop. We've added the first record, and then we've got to the second record, and the inputs we've received for the customer, which is the item that we're getting from the loop doesn't contain the field date. So essentially, because we used dot notation as the pathway, dot notation expects, it's like a strict mode. It expects that the record exists in order to be able to add it to the database. So when it doesn't find it, instead of um, adding nothing, it essentially throws an error saying this value doesn't exist. So for an important scenario where potentially your data isn't very clean, 
maybe using dot notation isn't the best methodology um, and you want to bring across all the data regardless of whether or not the path exists. So this is quite easy for us to resolve and simply instead of us accessing the pathway via dot notation, instead we can use the get filter. And all we would use for the get filter is get customer, which is the variable we've already got, and we want to get the pathway date. And what we've got here, which is nice now, is we can set the default value of this date pathway. So if it doesn't find it, by default, it's going to set the value to null. And I would need to remove this date section because we want to reference the customer. And we're getting the path date. And we want to do the exact same for the rest of these items. And I've actually already set this up. So if I hide this one here and I unhide it here, you'll see I've gone through and I've, I've actually set up um, making sure that I've selected the variable customer. I've then set the pathway individually for each record. So if I save this and I now rerun this part, this function again, it's taking a little bit longer, but success. So 103 statements in 1.47 seconds. It seems pretty quick. So you'll notice now that when I check in the debugger, we've added a whole lot more records. If we check the database and we refresh, all of our records are now here. So at the very first starting point, we've been able to um, essentially set up the integration between Bubble. We've now uh, called the API. We've got a response or a list of, of records back from Bubble. We've now added these records into our database. There's a few things I didn't set up with this though. We didn't set up the relationships and there was also 120 records inside of this response and we only added 100. So if you have more records, how would we deal with that? In the next session, I'm going to run through how to set up relationships and how to set up pagination to create a complete syncing process that you can then set to routinely sync your, your bubble database. So um, stay tuned and uh, next episode, we'll, we'll run through that.